welcome to the, I don't know how many meetings of our town's our city institute. Uh, we've been in existence, believe it or not, for more than four years. And we've put out all kinds of newsletters and everything. So, and we're very proud of what we've accomplished. So it's good to see people here interested tonight in what's been happening to our city. And as I indicated a little earlier, it does get a little rough in spots. Don't get discouraged, there is hope, okay? So before any more, I'll, oh, for those, those who don't know who I am, my name is Tom Price. Uh, we have other members of our towns, our city here tonight as well. And we do reflect public opinion. All of us that are involved are talking to people every day in every walk of life. So this isn't just an elite group. It's not a uh, advocacy group. It's not a uh, bashing group. We don't want to bash anybody. However, we will stand up for our own selves and some of the stuff that we see put out, we have to defend. So if you think we're being nasty, it's only from self-defense. So to go on, the mission of Our Towns, Our City is stated at the top of this slide, and that's what this meeting's all about. It's not intended as a forum for candidates to declare their platforms, to criticize any candidates, or to rehash the past. It is simply to inform and engage voters in preparation for the October 24th, 22 election. I don't normally read what I'm saying. I usually ad lib most presentations, but this presentation to me is so important, I've written it down and I will be reading most of it. And I apologize for that, but it is to me very critical. We're not here to campaign for anybody. We wish to, as informatively as possible, make you aware that the present is not what it's being portrayed as. And unless change is made, the portrayed future is not going to be possible. In 2014, the voters of Ward 2 in 20 different town hall meetings across that ward gave very strong direction to the councilor candidate for Ward 2. That direction said that they had three priorities. The first priority was common sense. The section, second one, they wanted cultural change in the city. And the third, they wanted structural change that serviced everybody. Based on observation and feedback from you, the public, since then, it's the opinion of OTOCI that the objectives of that direction were and remain valid, but have become more urgent. While well, that candidate has been working towards those directions, progress has been slow and strongly resisted. What has been done instead will be seen in the next slide. And I caution you, some of you are gonna gasp in horror when you see what it is, but it is real. So without further ado, current council has either committed or are trying to commit the 4.56 billion of our taxes that you see at the bottom here. 1.5 million can be stopped by an omnibus motion in a common sense council. That means council can stop any of those projects at any time or all of them if they put them all in one motion. There's a common fallacy out there that says, oh well it's too far, we've spent too much money, we can't stop. No, it's never too stop late to stop a bad decision. Fire optimization at the top of the list is not included in the 4.56 billion because it never happened. Council and the public were told the report preparation did not cost anything. They prepared a report estimated at $100 million, but it didn't cost anything to, rep to prepare that report. Common sense refutes that claim. The report was extremely faulty and council refused to receive it, but they also refused to kill it. It's still alive in many aspects. A new fire modernization report has been completed, but the corporation is refusing to release it until after the election. 
OTOCI estimate another $100 million cost. They'll probably argue with that, but if the costs follow the trend of the KED and Junction East, even if they say it's $50 million, that may only be half of the cost. So it could easily be $100 million. It's hard to imagine anything less with the way these projects go. Candidates and the public should be aware of what they'll be facing before the election. Why is the cost in that report being held back until after the election? Every candidate that's running should be stomping their feet and saying, hey, we need to know this. We need to know what the public are going to face after we're done with this election. They are refusing to do that. The net zero emission spending, a green project, has been approved at $1 billion by 2050. No projects defined for that $1 billion. Just as projects come up, they keep adding it. But the billion dollars is approved spending. We're seeing them doing it. We're building bicycle lanes, hiking paths. We're doing all kinds of things that violate the whole, uh, I guess, the whole spirit of net zero emissions. And they can get away with it. They've got the money. Asset maintenance is an ongoing accumulation of debt expected to reach $3.2 by 2026. And we'll get into that in more detail later. Debenture interest is for two bullet debentures already borrowed, totaling $308 million, with interest on that borrowing of $220 million. So it will cost us, the taxpayers, $220 million of interest to use that $308 million. That's two-thirds of the value of that project, or that m lending. Homelessness, drugs, and mental health issues are not dealt with herein. And if anybody's wondering why, it's because at the present moment, those issues are nothing more than talk and money. There has been no serious addressing of the issue. So I can't address it in here. I'm not going to say anything about it other than that, okay? The following. These are less glamorous, but I'm sure many of you will whoops, will recognize what's said and the responses. When we have problems, for example, I'll just go through the one, it's a perfect storm. When they can't get snow removal done and they can't keep the roads open, well, we had a perfect storm. Well, we seem to have all of our storms in the wintertime is perfect. None of the neighboring Communities have these perfect storms. They don't fall anywhere except in our community. So that's not a proper answer. It defies common sense. So why are we getting these excuses? And as you go down the list, you'll see it on almost every one of them. And probably the most offensive uh, is the one at the very bottom regarding the KED. We were told that uh, the LPAT hearing was told that the public delayed this project, costing, them tw costing us $20 million more. When they were caught up in it, they had to admit that that was not true. So they backtracked and withdrew that from the LPAT hearings. Last fall, in November, the OTOCI issued a cost, what we estimated the cost of the KED to be at $200 million. They, and we have the emails demonstrating this, they plotted internally between the corporation and count some counselors to have a mock question and answer period in council belittling our $200 million number. Everybody knows what it came out at. It came out at $200 million, so they stopped it. And that does not include interest. This is a major cultural problem when we have these type of issues and get these type of answers. And these aren't lonely. I could put up 10 pages like that, but I'm going to limit it to 10 for tonight. Or for one for tonight, sorry. <laughs> Didn't want to scare you there. This slide is not about me. 
and it's not about the CAO's criticism of me. It's about verification of OTOCI statements. In the next two slides, we'll show you where we get our information. The CAO claims that we don't know what we're talking about in OTOCI. They claim our numbers are wrong, that we don't understand this stuff. You'll see that in the next two slides. It's also about the CAO's lack of common sense in other points he tries to make. For example, he wrote this to a member of OTOCI, belittling me and the rest of OTOCI, assuming that the recipient of this would not have the common sense to know that it's not true. In fact, he knows it is true. And he's here with us tonight. He could verify it if anybody doubts that. So, common sense knows what's stated at the bottom of this slide is true. In spite of the CAO saying a deficit is different from a debt, deficit and debt are both not having enough money to pay what's owed. There's no difference. If you don't have a deficit in your bank account, guess what? It's a debt, you gotta pay it back. And he makes a claim like this. That's belittling everybody in this city, telling everybody that he thinks we're idiots. Shame on him. It's this lack of common sense that is problem problematic. As asset maintenance deferrals are so large, exceeding 2.7 billion, the next four slides are devoted to verifying the need to use common sense, make cultural change and structural change, starting with the next council. Asset deferral maintenance, and I'll just give you a couple seconds to quickly read that first paragraph. That paragraph is based on one of many papers, technical papers, in, across North America and parts of Europe. The APPA was originally known as the Association of Physical Plant Administrators. It's now known as APPA Leadership in Educational Facilities and their Body of Knowledge, which is the BOK. A cultural and structural change in how asset maintenance should be addressed originated in the early 1970s in the United States, but has failed to arrive in Greater Sudbury yet. We still treat it as a deferral and a deficit. We don't enter it in the books as a debt. Our city doesn't. Everywhere across the U.S., not everywhere yet, but many, many places across the U.S. have recognized that it is a debt and it goes against their bottom line. Common sense indicates that cultural change is long overdue in our city. Going further, this paper summarizing where asset maintenance costs were impacting public costs was published in 2017 by Strategic Partnerships Incorporated. Their conclusion, and I again will let you read that yourselves, Asset deferrals and deficits are debt. There's no escaping it. The city of Greater Sudbury has been reluctantly addressing the problem by dragging their feet and developing a plan for enterprise asset management and only addressing province of Ontario legislated key essential assets, having a replacement value of more than 9.1 billion. That's our water, our roads, Everything the city owns is not 9.1 billion, it's just the key assets that are 9.1 billion. Our total assets are worth over 10 billion. The balance of the assets having a replacement value of 1.3 billion is being deferred to sometime unidentified later date by a future council. They're still not prepared to address it. And any of the candidates that are here, you better be wondering what you're facing going into this mess. 
One thing is certain, taxpayers will be paying the cost. In addition to all that, tax CGS staff has removed assets from cost centers, eliminating any knowledge of what a cost center is actually costing taxpayers. And by that, I'll use a fire hall as an example. The fire halls do not belong to fire services anymore. They belong to a group called asset management. So if you wanna know what that fire station's costing, you can't find out. And believe me, I've looked. So you have to go to asset management, peel out whatever that fire station is, if it's identified, and then combine that with the operating costs. And to do it is just almost impossible. So when we get this new fire modernization report, how are you gonna know how that compares to what we're doing now? So that takes us there. On August the 9th, 2022, I'm sure most of you remember this, council listened to an integrity commissioner and fined one councilor over $4,000, 40 days pay. Now, that decision was based on lies. And as you can see, it states that so there. That first paragraph has been confirmed by one of the le top legal minds in Ontario, if not in Canada. It's also been confirmed by one of the top in uh, labor relations minds here in Sudbury. And he's confirmed it in the paper. So why did this council take such illegal and penalizing actions against one other councillor? The culture has to change. The bottom part, it's written by the Voice of Governing Institute, and it's a think tank based in California that offers policy analysis and advice to governing institutions that are widely based across North American continent and other countries of the world. They are an advisor to presidents of the US, Congress, Senate, local go state governments. So what they say surely must hold some water when we draw on their expertise, we're told that we don't know what we're talking about. Well, there it is. Like pension debt, they weren't recognizing it. In 1970, they started to. Now it's a standard, and credit rating agencies are having to adjust their credit ratings because of that additional debt. Greater Sudbury has continued in 2019, 2020, 2021, and the budget for 2022 to use credit ratings from Standard & Poor's that did not recognize asset maintenance as a debt. That's $2.7 billion of debt that they did not report in the annual report or in the budgets. In 2022, Standard & Poor's, that's this year, credit rating agency changed their evaluation system because of pressure in the US and across 21 communities in Ontario increased their credit ratings part, carte blanche from AA to AA+. That was due to them reevaluating how they evaluate credit ratings. Our mayor and our CAO came out very proud that this was due to the good job that they were doing. Excellent job. Well, I'm sorry, it's just not true. And quite frankly, what they did was lying to everybody. Greater Ch Sudbury chose to promote that and that culture's gotta stop. So you wonder why cultural change is required? Well, there it is. Structural change. This slide shows why structural change is required in how we do our budgets, how we prepare them. This is the Onaping Falls Community Center. <coughs> and if you will notice, in one year, the cost of window replacement jumped from 75,000 to 975,000. In one year. Did all the windows break in a hailstorm? Not at all. Is that just windows or is it other stuff? You have no way of knowing. 
Now, recently, this has come up again because they had roof leaks. The counselor for that area had to put in a request or a motion to have staff prepare a business case to repair the roof leak. That business case would have taken until this fall for the 2023 election or budget. Then it would be planned for 2023 if it got approved. You've got a leaking roof in a public venue and you've got to make a business case to fix it. We've got to be changing how we do our budgets and how we address our expenses. Like that is just utter nonsense. <coughs> they tried that in Elliott Lake and didn't fix the roof. It collapsed, killing two people. We don't want that in our city. Uh, that it, oh, there is help out there. The NASA is the National Association of State Facilities Administrators, and in December of 2020, they published a guide for how to determine reasonable maintenance costs and how deferral of those costs multiply instead of being additive. 20 years of deferral can easily multiply the cost 15 to 20 times. So a maintenance item of $1,000 that's left for 20 years can end up costing you $20,000. That's published. It's all over. It's on Facebook, or not on Facebook, it's on uh, the internet. You can look at this. Why aren't our city people doing that? This is well established. It's based on studies upon studies. Zero-based budgets have been rejected by council as too much work for the staff to do. The poor individuals. It's easier to throw our money away than it is to have staff do a little bit of extra work to get control of the budget. So what are they waiting for, bankruptcy? We're not far away. In fact, technically, we are bankrupt right now. We are bankrupt, oh God. We cannot meet the bills. We can meet the daily bills they talk about, but there's $2.7 billion worth of bills in asset management they're not meeting. And it's falling behind by another $160 million a year. They're not meeting that $160 million. More consulting fees. Many of the reasons why change is needed was demonstrated in the major issues slide that you saw right up front and reinforced in the common sense slide that you saw. However, those issues merely magnify the real reason change is needed. That real reason is the baby boom bubble. That bubble of people is leaving our workforce pool. It originated in between 45 and 65, and management has consistently chosen to ignore that change in our demographics. In fact, they'll tell you how our population's increasing. Great. And it's going to continue to increase. And it will. The third StatsCan census 2011 was the population distribution in Sudbury in 2011. 2021 is last year, they did it again. From those numbers, if you deduct the difference between 2021 and 2011, over 10 years, the change in each age group is shown in the left. So we lost 1,035 in the under 19, we gained 2,000 in the 20 to 39, uh, we lost 3,270 in the 40 to 64, we gained 7,985 in the over 65s, and our workforce pool shrunk by 2895. That's 3,000. Between now and a projected 2031, a 10-year move forward, you can see the numbers on the right. Now, the numbers that the city talks about increasing are the bottom line. And you can see 2021, yeah, we've got 165,000 people now. We used to have 160,000 in 2011. 
And in 2031, we'll have 172,000. But that's not workers paying taxes. And when you get to 2031, we will have lost 3,000 in the uh, under 19. We will have lost 2560 in the 20 to 39 level. We will have lost 4485 in our maximum tax level but we will have gained 16,240 in the over 65s on fixed incomes. Workforce pool will have shrunk by another 6,900. And you'll see in a moment why it will shrink. So we have a total population gain of 6,240, but our workforce, the ones that are making money to pay for things is shrinking. The reason it's called a work for or a population ba or a baby boom bubble is that's what it is. This is a graph from the, I think it's the World Bank or wherever, but anyhow, between 1945 and 1965, the fertility rate jumped like that peak. The stability or sustainable level of population is the blue line across the middle. In 65 and later, it dropped below that sustainability level. This is a worldwide phenomenon, okay? That bubble, as noted here, has marched along annually. It has never recurred. And you might think that it would recur when that group of people got to be of reproduction age, that there would be another boom because of that. It did not happen, for good reason. By the time we got to the 1990s, 19, late 80s and 90s, birth control had become almost standard. The pill had been invented. Uh, diaphragms were invented. Uh, plan family planning had become very popular. Uh, workforces were under pressure to maintain their s income levels. So one income families started to become less and less feasible. Two people had to go out to make a living and today it's very rare where a one, family or one working family member can support the family. That's all decreased. So what does this mean? Well, this first slide is the second of two that we prepared earlier. The, First one we put out in July of 2018. This one we put out in 2021. And it shows the progression from 2006 to 2011 to 2016, projected to 2026 and projected to 2041. You can see the bubble is walking across the page. There's nothing coming in behind to fill that bubble. That's a fact. So, and you can see the over 65 is growing. So what does it look like in the latest one? Well, this is what it looks like in the latest one. The StatsCan numbers, and these aren't our numbers, these are directly out of StatsCan reports. The bubble in 2011 was as shown. In 2021, it's there. And we're predicting in 2031 it will be there. Where those bubbles were, in our workforce pool is going to be down to where that dotted black line is. Where are we going to get the workers to pay for all these projects you saw on the first page? Further to that, look at how the over 65s are climbing. Those are going to be on fixed income. Where are they going to get the money to pay the increased taxes necessary to make the difference because we don't have the workforce anymore? And if anybody believes that we can import skilled workers here to fill that gap, guess again. This graph is repeated in almost every community, certainly in the free world. They all have this same problem. So where are we going to get skilled workers to fill that gap? So who's going to be paying for all those bills you saw at the front? There isn't going to be anybody to pay it. This gap already I hear comments all the time, well, the kids today, they don't want to work, they're lazy, blah, 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 blah. 
but quite frankly, they're not lazy. The number of lazy ones as a percentage of the youth hasn't changed. What has changed is there's no youth out there to hire. You can see where that line is now. It's flatlining just above 10,000. And it's been flatlining since 2006. But we keep on doing things. We keep on committing ourselves to big projects. Oh yeah, well, we'll pay it. Uh, <laughs> and I hate to use his name again, but C.A. Archer calls it intergenerational equity. And intergenerational equity says that, okay, for a benefit, you can spread the cost out over the life of the benefit. So if you have an arena, you can spread the cost out over the life of the arena. However, that's not equity. At that point, it's only liability. It only becomes equity if you have asset maintenance in place to make sure in the 30th year those taxpayers still get the same benefit as we are this year. Then it becomes equity. But we don't have that maintenance plan in place. So at this point in time, what he's calling intergenerational equity is intergenerational liability. And it won't be equity until we get a good maintenance plan. The second bubble it was so small 30 years ago that is, we just called it a baby burp instead of a baby bubble, it, uh, baby boom bubble. It, it isn't big enough to cure anything. That birth control, the family planning, all those items, we don't have that coming at us. If that isn't enough to scare anybody, I don't know what is. But we'll continue on. Swings in the workforce pool have in the past been driven by supply-demand swings in the mining industry. And that was good while we had a large work pool. The work pool went up and down. People left town. They came into town. But the baby boom bubble is not driven by the mining industry. Greater Sudbury City visionaries are looking at the mining industry recovery to fix it. It won't. Our mining is flatlining. Even with the big contracts for nickel by Tesla and cobalt and all this stuff, we're not going to see that boom again. Ask any metal economist. Like, it's, there's so much competition in the world now for nickel what Sudbury produces is only a small portion of it. There will be some rise, and it will fall, but it's not going to bring us back to where that bubble took us. A budget process that doesn't budget according to needs has been driving operating and capital costs out of control. We budget for things that's nice to have, a new arena, an art gallery, a library, a Place des Arts, all of these projects, yeah, they're nice to have. They're lovely to have. But what about the needs of our infrastructure? What about the needs of where we're going to do for, do for water and do for transportation as time goes on? The budget does not accommodate that. It does not even split mandatory work from discretionary work. Every project gets the same treatment, except the maintenance. Faulty public institutions, accounting practices, following World War II, didn't recognize maintenance deferrals as institutional debt. But it was recognized in the early 70s, as I've stated before, and by the late 90s, corrections were starting to be made across the continent, except in Great Sudbury. We're still not recognizing it. We've been forced to by the provincial government. They have passed a statute telling the city that they have to have an enterprise asset maintenance plan for critical assets like water, roads, uh, emergency services, but not for the other ones. That's only including 
some nine billion dollars worth of our assets. What about the other 1.3 billion? We're going to let them rot? Well, you saw what's happening to the Anaping Falls Community Center. The days are over when visionary goals are going or can be acceptable. We have to get real. City of Sudbury has to change. That change won't come through dinosaur administrators. It can't only come, or it can only come from common people with common sense. That's us. That recognize the priority that needs to be placed on cultural and structural change. Applying common sense has always encountered resistance from administrators and bureaucrats. That has not changed, and their resistance has been building with unacceptable attitudes and responses to the public, which you've seen a sheet of, and the installation of turf protections. They've actually built barriers inside of City Hall so that you can't reach out and touch anybody. That culture needs to change, and it needs to change now. We can't continue this way. With common sense and cultural change comes the opportunity to make the structural changes that are needed. And accounting and operating practices can be identified, adopted, and practiced. When you drive one of these municipal tractors with a snowplow on it, 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers to plow three or four sidewalks, then drive it back again, that's not common sense. That's not efficient use of our dollars. That's just nonsense. I, I would tell you what's going on in Falconbridge right now, but it's not part of the presentation, so in the question period, if you want to know, ask me. <laughs> uh, we can help. To assist in the evaluation of candidates for council positions, OTOCI has designed a comparison system based not on what promises are made, but instead what priorities the candidates demonstrate they will practice if elected to their sought after position. If they demonstrate that they are about bringing common sense, cultural change, structural change to the city, they will get full marks in this system. If they don't demonstrate that, but they talk a good story, they won't get good marks. There is one of these sheets for the mayoral candidates, there's one for each ward. What we're hoping is to find volunteers in each ward to keep an eye on the candidates in that ward and establish a database that they can fill this in. And prior to the election date, we will issue those sheets. We will put out a memo to everybody on the MIA distribution list. So if you know volunteers who would be good at that, we're willing to hear. We want them to come forward. We need the help. So that, with the exception of this, is the end of the presentation. <coughs> and that says that it isn't sustainable, but what is sustainable is that. That's our objective. We've got to get to that if this city is not going to go bankrupt. So that is the end of the presentation. So John is going to turn off the camera now so we don't embarrass anybody by having them show up on a YouTube, okay? Uh, but.